Father in heaven, as we look at this last topic today, um, it's a solemn one. It's a very serious one that affects each one of us. And I just pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to receive your truth. Please speak to us, help us to understand exactly what it is you want us to take away from this. May this not just be an event, but may we experience that transforming power that you want to work in our lives. I pray, Lord, for clarity of mind for every one of us, and especially me, that I will speak your words. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Why did the Jews reject Jesus? Any ideas? Okay, so they kind of picked and chose, right? They chose the, the, the scriptures that they liked. Do we do any of that today? But let's go deeper than that. Why? Why did they pick and choose? Why did they only take some of the counsel? Perhaps one of the saddest statements in the spirit of prophecy that says, for more than a thousand years, the Jewish people had awaited the Savior's coming. Upon this event, they had rested their brightest hopes. In song and prophecy, in temple rite and household prayer, they had enshrined his name. And yet, at his coming, they knew him not. That's a sad statement. John chapter 1, verse 11 echoes the same thoughts as it says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But why? Why was the event so anticipated, but not recognized when it came? Why did those who sought deliverance not recognize their deliverer? Why did God's own people not only not recognize their Savior, but crucify the fulfillment of their entire system of government, economy, and religion? And what about us, the professed people of God today? There's an interesting statement in Desire of Ages, 299. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ sought to undo the work that had been wrought by... What's that say? And we can't see the screen? False education. And to give his hearers a right conception of his kingdom and his own, of his own character. So in seeking to give his hearers a right understanding of his kingdom and character, what was Jesus trying to undo? He was trying to undo the work that had been wrought by false education. Or we could say it this way, why did the Jews not understand Jesus' mission or the character of his work and thus reject and crucify him? It was because of false education. And this statement made me think. It made me study. What kind of false education? Because it says false education had given them a misconception of the work of Jesus. Are we perhaps in danger of having false education? that makes us not understand the work Jesus wants to do for us? That's really what it boiled down to, right? Jesus was there, but they didn't understand the work that he wanted to do for them because of false education, it says. And I began to see through study, as we're going to look at, that the failure of the Jewish nation to recognize Jesus was as a result of false education over a period of many years for centuries that have been adopted very slowly. Let's seek to understand these failures. To start to understand this, we need to go actually back to the Garden of Eden and understand the act that changed the course of the universe. That was the fall. 
We often focus on the fall as disobedience, which was eating what God had told them not to. That was certainly real, but the real problem was deeper. What caused the disobedience? What caused the disobedience? Let me say it this way. If someone tells me, don't go into that building, it's dangerous, and I go there anyway, have I disobeyed? Yeah, okay. But why? What was that? Self-will. Self -will. Okay. Ah, lack of belief, probably because of my self-will. I distrusted the person who told me don't go into that building, right? Whether I just didn't believe them at all or I just wanted to choose my own belief, whatever the reason is, the fact of the matter is I thought that what they said really wasn't valid and so I just went into the building anyway. Now, my decision to go into that building against that person's counsel, does it place them first or me first? Clearly places me first, right? <laughs> You see, distrust is placing yourself ahead of someone else. Distrust is trusting yourself, not someone else. Distrust is trusting your wisdom over someone else's wisdom. And in the case of sin, it is distrusting my wisdom over God's wisdom. Are we making sense? You see, trust, there has to be trust in something. You can't have a situation with zero trust. If you're not trusting in someone's counsel or God's counsel, you're then trusting in yourself. That was the fall of Adam and Eve. It was the first decision in the universe, well, <laughs> Not in the universe. Satan had done it before. Lucifer had done it before. It was the first decision in the, on the world which placed man's wisdom ahead of God's wisdom. Notice, spirit of prophecy, it, there was nothing poisonous in the fruit itself. And the sin was not merely in yielding to appetite. It was, what does that say? Distrust of God's goodness disbelief, that's just another word for distrust, right? Distrust of God's goodness, disbelief of his word, and rejection of his authority that made our first parents transgressors and that brought into the world a knowledge of evil. It was this that opened the door to a few different sins in the world. Every species of falsehood and error. What was the root of Adam and Eve's sin? Is this on, Jonathan? Yeah, it is on. Okay. Okay. Making sure you guys can hear me okay? The root of Adam and Eve's sin was distrust of God's goodness. But it wasn't only the root of Adam and Eve's sin. It was the root of every species of falsehood and error today. Every sin ever has its root in distrust. Or we could say it this way. Every sin ever is trusting in self rather than believing in God. Because what's another word we use for trust? Faith. And notice this. Eve, infatuated, flattered, beguiled, did not discern the deception. She coveted what God had forbidden. She distrusted his wisdom. She cast away faith, the key of knowledge. And what is knowledge? To know God. How do we know God? We have to have faith. Faith in God's wisdom in place of our own is key. It's the key to true versus false education. Implicit faith in God will lead us to knowledge of God, to true education, while trusting in ourselves places us on the side of the enemy to receive false education. Let me say it this way. All sin has its root in the exaltation of human wisdom above faith in the divine. Now, what does it do to us when we take this course? Education, page 28. I hope, by the way, that all of you are becoming inspired to study this profound and incredible book called Education. 
it never ceases to amaze me. Sin not only shuts us away from God, but destroys in the human soul both the desire and the capacity for knowing him. When we exalt human reasoning above faith in God, we sin, and what does that do to us? It destroys in us the ability to know God. Furthermore, well, okay, it destroys in us the desire to know God, and furthermore, even the ability, the capacity to know God. Put simply, sin blinds our eyes to our need of deliverance. Now remember, we're looking at why the Jews rejected Jesus. And we're applying this to our day. If we're trusting in ourselves, why do we need Jesus? Do you think Satan might want to have an educational plan that leads us to trust in ourselves? That'll teach us not to need Jesus. Because it is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. We must know our real condition or we shall not feel our need of Christ's help. We must understand our danger or we shall not flee to the refuge. We must feel the pain of our wounds or we should not desire healing. Do we have any doctors here? No doctors. Some of you maybe have gone to the doctor. Medical missionaries, that's, that's good. Question though. Last week, did you wake up just feeling amazing and you're like, today is the perfect day to go to the doctor? <laughs> Why would you do that, right? You go to the doctor when you're sick. We're not going to flee to Jesus if we don't see our need. But here's the scary part. Sin blinds us to our need. That's why the Laodicean message says you need ISAV. You're in sin. You don't see your need. You're never going to flee to the one who can rescue from you from that. And so you need to ask the one who can rescue from you from that to open your eyes so you can see your need so you flee to the refuge. We're in a hopeless situation without Jesus' help. But you see, Satan has been trying for centuries to accomplish this, to make us not see our need. That was Adam's act of distrusting God at this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It placed mankind on a system, on a road to false education. Slowly, over centuries, he became more blinded, leading him not to recognize his deliverer when he came. Sin blinds man to his need of a deliverer. Thus it's Satan's object to get us to trust in reason and in self so that we don't see our need for Jesus. Now this exact principle is explained in the book, I have it here, Living Fountains of Broken Cisterns by Sutherland. Incredible book. This is like the great controversy from a true versus false educational perspective. The God-given system of education is found among the, as found among the Hebrews rested upon faith, not trust in self, and developed the spiritual side of man's nature, making it possible in the highest sense for divinity to unite with humanity. That's the key. As to paganism and its system of education, what was the religion of the pagan world? And what were the ideas it strove to propagate? First, it placed above God the study and worship of self. Two systems of education. True education in the original Hebrew system taught men to rely on God to unite divinity with humanity so they could overcome sin. False education found in paganism placed self and man's reason above the, wis the wisdom of God's. We find a very similar statement in Desire of Ages. Through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned men away from God, but he won his great triumph in perverting the faith of Israel by contemplating and worshiping what? Their own conceptions. The heathen had lost a knowledge of God and had become more and more corrupt. So it was with Israel. The principle that man can save himself by his own works, 
lay at the foundation of some of the heathen religions? <laughs> Every heathen religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle. Do you see what happen has happened here? Over centuries, Satan had implanted the principle in the minds of the Jewish religion, of, of, those, uh, of the Jews in their religion, that you can save yourself by your own works. So when the deliverer comes, what do you need deliverance from? You're saving yourself. And when we study the experience in the um, Babylonian captivity, we find that the Jews actually re failed to remain separate in Babylon, failed to be the light that God designed them to be, and they began to be strongly influenced by Babylonian culture. And this continued through the time of Medo-Persia, and then we come to the time of Greece. Alexander is, Alexander the Great, we know him for his wars of conquest, but Greece is known for a lot more than war. Greece is actually more famous for their philosophy and for their system of education. And their ideas captured the nation of Israel. Haskell says, Babylon enslaved the bodies of God's people. Medo-Persia made laws to slay them, but Greece captured their minds and enslaved them to her ideas. She counterfeited so neatly, so adroitly the spiritual teachings of the Old Testament, and yet so, sorry, and so quietly yet so surely wound her tendrils about God's people that her slavery was far worse than that of Egypt or Babylon. And what was what the major characteristic of Greek education is, is it exalts the mind of man. The history of Greece is the history of physical and intellectual culture. The people admired grace and beauty, and her literary minds worshipped the intellect. Plato, the greatest of Greek philosophers, lived 400 years before Christ, and his teachings have led the thoughts of writers in every age since then. How long was the intertestamental period? Anyone know? Between Malachi and Matthew? 400 years. Full of Greek teaching. Full of the science of Plato. The Jews mingled the teachings of the Bible with the philosophy of Plato, and that formed the traditions of men against which Christ so often warned his followers. This false philosophy, the false philosophy and the science falsely so-called of Paul's time was Greek teaching, which breathed the spirit of Plato and his students. Here in Greek religion and Greek learning was the most subtle form of the mixture of truth and error which Satan offered at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice, mixture of truth and error. What was the issue of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Is that it was good and evil. God says, I've given you truth. Satan says, you need more than that. God is truth. So any mixture of truth and error is exalting man's wisdom about God's because you say, I need more than what God has given me. It exalts man's reasoning. That was the core of Greek education. Plato himself, listen to this. There is a science of sciences, I call it dialectic, which is the intellect discriminating the false and the true. That should sound like blasphemy. It is. The intellect discriminating the false and the true. Now, has God given us an intellect? Yes. yes. Does he expect us to cultivate it? Yes but that should be in subjection to the word of God. The intellect is not the standard. The word of God is the standard. It is the word of God which should be studied, not the intellect of man. For the Christian, it's God's wisdom and judgment which must be accepted and followed and trusted above everything else. And yet, sadly, it is this same philosophy of Plato which is followed today in the name of a broad education. Don't be so narrow-minded, we hear. 
Any mixture of truth and error places the mind of man over God. It's a blasphemous statement of discontent with what God has provided. Now, as regards the science of all sciences, does that ring a bell, those of you, students of Spirit of Prophecy? Is there a statement about the science of all sciences in the Spirit of Prophecy? There is. The science of redemption is the science of all sciences. What's Plato say? Science of all sciences, the intellect discriminating true and the false. Spirit of Prophecy says the science of redemption is the science of all sciences. The science that is the study of, all the, ang of the angels and of all the intelligences of the unfallen worlds. The science that engages the attention of our Lord and Savior. The science that enters into the purpose brooded into the mind of the infinite, kept in silence through times eternal. The science that will be the study of God's redeemed throughout endless ages. This is the highest study in which it is possible for men to engage. But... In Plato's science of the sciences, you're worshiping the intellect. You're depending more and more on yourself as you rise higher and higher in your own estimation. In this science of the sciences, day by day, as man studies this, he realizes more and more his utter insignificance. He learns to recognize his own weakness and insufficiency and depend more and more on the wisdom and strength of God. You see, Plato's sciences of the sciences is the intellect discriminating between the true and the false, and the lesson taught is dependence on man. But Jesus' science of the sciences is the science of redemption, and the lesson taught is dependence upon God. Right here, we have true versus false education at its core. If you're following this plan, learning to rely on yourself, exalting your wisdom above God's, when the message, message comes that you need deliverance, you're not going to accept it because you're doing it yourself. And that's exactly what happened in the Jewish nation. Israel had been once miraculously delivered from physical bondage in Egypt. They had been warned against fleeing to Egypt for protection in the days of Nebuchadnezzar at the siege of Jerusalem. Yet though they escaped the bondage of those earlier times, they were captured by the learning of the Greeks. Many Jews flocked into Egypt, and those who remained in Jerusalem and Palestine imbibed many of the ideas of the Greeks. You see what happened. When the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity, they had their beautiful God-given system of schools and of education that they followed for many years. But slowly over time, they began to look to the world and desire more than the simple system that God had given them. Over time, they started sending their youth to Alexandria for the purpose, supposedly, of witnessing to them. Let me read you this from F.C. Gilbert, written in 1933, called Why the Jews Rejected Jesus. This is an excerpt from the article. You can look it up online if you want to read the whole thing. Greece assured the Jews that they desired to be their true friends and benefactors. They were desirous of learning more of the God of the Hebrews. An arrangement was entered into that allowed a large number of rabbis from Jerusalem to go to Alexandria and translate the writings of the Jewish scriptures into the Greek language. Greek scholarship and learning was seeking every possible avenue of information to enhance the value of its own culture and refinement. You notice the difference here. Greek was what? Greece was what? They were seeking anything they could get to enhance what they had. That's Greek philosophy. There's no truth, it's your truth and my truth, and we just gather as much information as possible and let the mind of man discern what they think is right. God says there's one truth. This is the way, walk ye in it. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. It was also suggested by the Greeks and the, that the Jews send their talented young men to Alexandria for training and instruction in the philosophies, sciences, and learning of the Greeks. Many of the elders in Israel feared the results of such a course. 
The sages remembered the sorrows of their ancestors who came into contact with heathen custom, manners and customs. They counseled the younger men against such a procedure. These in turn argued that it would be an advantage for strong, youthful, vigorous, thoughtful, vigorous young men to enter the schools of Greece as they might influence the philosophers and Greek scholars to see the value and beauty of the Jewish religion and some of the learned Greeks might embrace Judaism. Do you see the excuse being made here? We'll be a witness to them. Yet the aged men of Israel advised against it. They maintained that should the younger men be given encouragement to come into contact with the learning of the heathen, it might be ruinous to the future of the Jewish race. Interjection here. It's always good to listen to your elders. Greece assured the fathers in Israel they might hold to their own standards of religion. They were encouraged to believe that the synagogues where the children were taught their religion would not be interfered with. They would be strengthened if the teachers of the law should only imbibe the wisdom and learning of the scholars of Greece. And, here's the other lie, by receiving recognition from the world's greatest nation, the graduates of the Jewish schools would find it greatly to their advantage. Accreditation. Many of, the, the, is, many of Israel's influential men yielded to Greek insistence. <clears throat> the former said that God would help their young men to be true to their religion, and these training schools of Jewry would have a better standing in the eyes of the nations. What did God say in Deuteronomy? Follow my statutes. This is your wisdom in the eyes of the nations, which shall look and say, surely this is a wise and understanding people. And it had reached a point here, they said, if we can go to Greece, if we can get their learning, we'll be recognized in the eyes of the nations. The men of Israel were made to feel that the advantages of the Jewish scholars would be immeasurable. They would have incentives, goals to reach. The young men would gain knowledge, influence, prestige, the more they advanced in learning, the higher would be their attainments. Gradually, the Jewish schools came to confer degrees upon their graduates. There was the Rav, or Rabbi. That was a Greek title, Rabbi. The Tanya, the Ganyan, the Sadi, the Rabban. It was thought necessary for the graduates of the rabbinical schools to show their mark show the mark of their rank by wearing different clothing. The man with a degree must wear a peculiar distinctive gown and cap. Little by little, an educational aristocracy was formed, which was called the Sanhedrin. It's crucified Jesus. The term is of Greek origin. They did have an original system of judgment God had set up, but it was perverted by this Greek philosophy. While the religious schools continued to operate, a marked declension in spiritual influence and power was visible. Year by year, the word of God was studied less as the courses in, of studies based on culture and philosophy increased. The curriculum of the rabbinical schools was influenced toward intellectualism. As the years passed, man became exalted and God was less thought of. The rabbi was extolled, the unlearned were depreciated. Piety gradually diminished as form and ceremony increased. In the ethics of the fathers, the rabbis taught, a child of five years should study the Bible. At 10, the Mishnah. At 15, the Gemara. The Mishnah is a voluminous commentary of the Bible. The Gemara is a commentary on the Mishnah. So as the student advanced in years and developed in mental acumen, he studied God's word less and man's writings more. And so between the end of the book of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew, we have a period of time in which we call the intertestamental period, 400 years of silence. What should have been happening then? Haskell puts it very well. The location of the Jews in Palestine and her capital was by divine appointment. 
They were at the gateway of the nations and might have held the balance of power. Had they held aloft the sword of the spirit, all nations would have bowed before their kings and paid tribute into their treasury. Instead of flocking to Alexandria for the wisdom of Greece, nations should have sent their youth to the schools of the prophets at Jerusalem. And scholars of the world would have sought, should have sought the wisdom from those who knew the God of wisdom. But it was not so. Israel then was as the church of today. Instead of leading by virtue of the spiritual life, she sought the wisdom of Egypt and Greece. And thus we have 400 years of silence. 400 years without a prophet. Why? Was it because God had just decided to take a vacation? <laughs> Was God on vacation for 400 years? The traditions of men. It was because he couldn't find someone. Couldn't find a family that wasn't so tainted by Greek education that they would listen to his voice and raise up a prophet. The history of Greece fills the time between the prophecy of Malachi and John the Baptist. We can now understand why Israel was so long without the sound of a prophet's voice. God gave Israel a system of education, separate and distinct from the system of all other nations, a system which if followed would forever make it impossible for the people to go into captivity. But Israel often gave up her God-given system for the teaching of heathen nations. When the Jews returned from Babylon, they were strongly tinctured with Babylonian ideas of education and religion. This prepared them to accept with readiness the teachings of the Greeks. The rabbis of Jerusalem mingled the principles of Greek philosophy so thoroughly with the statutes of Jehovah, which they were commanded to teach their children, that from the death of Malachi to the birth of John the Baptist, there was not a family in Judah to whom the education of a prophet could be entrusted. Why was this silence? Was it because God's people had disowned him completely? Had God's people taken another name? No, they still call themselves the people of God. It wasn't because they had rejected God openly. It was because they had adopted a system of education which exalted man's wisdom above God's. It was 400 years when Israel's minds were so benumbed their eyes were so blinded by an education exalting self instead of God, of human wisdom in the place of faith, and thus saith the Lord. And so thus the way was paved for the rejection of Jesus. Notice, as a nation, the people of Israel, while desiring the advent of the Messiah, were so far separated from God in heart and life they could have no true conception of the character or mission of the promised Redeemer. Instead of desiring redemption from sin and the glory and peace of holiness, their hearts were fixed upon deliverance from their national foes and restoration to worldly power. When he came, they did not recognize him as the Messiah for whom they had so long waited. They were looking to themselves and they didn't see their need of deliverance from sin. Desire of Ages puts it very clearly as it simply says, while the Jews desired the advent of the Messiah, they had no true conception of his mission. They did not seek redemption from sin, but deliverance from the Romans. Friends, do we seek deliverance from our circumstances, from the physical things that annoy us, and not seek deliverance from sin? To recognize Jesus, we need to know what it is that we need help with. Is our education teaching us the lesson of reliance on self? That's the question we need to ask. Because Satan knows he will have success if he can get us not to see our need. So he's trying to get us to follow an educational program in which we rely on ourselves. But, I hear what you're saying. Can we apply this today? Haskell says 
What Greece would not gain in territory, she gained as a teacher of nations. The roots remain to this day. More than once as an intellectual power, Greece has arisen. Throughout the intellectual world, she has votaries bowing before her shrine, the mind of man. Her philosophy is today studied under the guise of modern writers. Her ideas are instilled into the minds of children from the kindergarten to the universities. Greek learning still rules the world. And you say, but really? I mean, <laughs> I don't teach my kids Greek philosophy. We don't study the Greek heroes in our system. Really? Still rules the world? Still being studied today? Still instilled into the minds of men? You know, our enemy is intelligent, Satan. He rarely pawns off the same lie twice. Rather, he repackages it. You ever seen that you go to the shops and it says, new label, same great product. Do you have that? Satan does the same thing. He doesn't call it Greek learning today. He calls it humanism. What is humanism? I went to the American Humanist Association. I wanted to see, like, what do they believe? Here it is, statement from the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism, or in other words, without God, or other supernatural beliefs, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. What's it saying here? In the absence of God, we have the ability to achieve good. Sounds like Greek philosophy to me. Humanist International. Humanism stands for the building up, uh, building up a more humane society through an ethics based on human or other natural values in the spirit of reason and free inquiry through human capabilities. It is not theistic. It does not accept supernatural views of reality. What are we relying on here? Human reason. What did Plato say? The science of all sciences is the intellect discriminating between the true and the false. Humanism is Greek philosophy repackaged with a different label. AmericanHumanist.org. In matters of belief, we find that reason, when applied to the evidence of our senses and our accumulated knowledge, is our most reliable guide for understanding the world and making our choices. That's, that's the words of Plato in different, I mean, that's the same thing. We base our understanding of the world on what we can perceive with our senses and comprehend with our minds. Straight Greek philosophy. You say, but I'm not studying humanism. Careful. The father of modern public education in the United States and certainly has influence here in England and all over the world. Anyone know who this is? John Dewey. Really interesting to me, I had a conversation a while ago with somebody who was arguing that John Dewey was a progressive educator who had ideas along the lines of true education. I said, well, it's true. Satan does insert some good in along with the bad to fool us. <laughs> mm -hmm. What did John Dewey say? And again, this man was incredibly influential. Faith in the prayer hearing God is an unproved and outmoded faith. There is no God and there is no soul. Hence, there are no needs for the props of traditional religion. With dogma and creed excluded, the immutable truth is also dead and buried. There is no room for fixed natural law or moral absolutes. I almost don't like reading that. It's terrible. This man was one of the greatest influencers of the modern public education system. Hailed even by Seventh-day Adventists as a progressive thinking educator. Oh, you say, well, that's secular humanism. We don't go along with that. All right. Anyone recognize that face? Maria Montessori? We've heard of Montessori, right? 
And it's really interesting. I just want to interject as I go into some of these. Again, Satan knows what he's doing. And he'll create something that is really good with a little bit of poison. That's what a counterfeit is, right? Sometimes when we talk about counterfeits, we think it's just this thing opposite to the truth. No, a counterfeit is something that looks so much like the truth, you've got to study to tell the difference. Maria Montessori. Her ideas of education are lauded around the world, including by many Seventh-day Adventists. And it's true, her ideas are much closer to true education. But does that make them true? No. And interestingly, someone sent, I think it was, they sent my mom this book. Anyway, I forget how I came across it, but sent it to my mom, I think. Ellen White and Maria Montessori, two women who revolutionized the world of education. It goes on to say that they believe Ellen White and Maria Montessori somehow got their ideas from the same source. Maybe they even met each other. <laughs> what blasphemy? Ellen White got her ideas from God. <laughs> Here's another one. Recognize that face? Charlotte Mason. Charlotte Mason. Another one very common, popular in Seventh-day Adventist conservative homeschooling circles. Charlotte Mason wasn't quite as humanist as Maria Montessori, but she was what is called a religious humanist, which I'm still scratching my head on. <laughs> like, I, know, I don't understand how that works, but regardless. She had a lot of good ideas. A really lot of good ideas. But one of the common threads through Maria Montessori, Charlotte Mason, and a lot of others in this category, they believe that there is an inherent good in the child which you just need to develop. Is that biblical? Is that biblical? Friends, no. no. What does the Bible say about us? There is nothing good in man. The heart is deceitfully wicked who can know it. Our only hope is dependence on God. An educational philosophy which says there's good in the child, you just have to bring it out and develop it, is Satan's lie. It's humanism and it's Greek philosophy, teaching you to depend on yourself. If you have good in yourself, what do you need God for? What do you need help from in overcoming sin? It's all in you. You just have to build it up and develop it. Another one of the ideologies very common in this is that we identify the strengths of the child and work with those. Just strengthen the strengths. <laughs> that one is so close. Does every child have strengths? Most certainly. Should we work with those? The interests of a child? Certainly. But the spirit of prophecy says we need to strengthen the weak points of our characters to build up a balanced character. Why? Because Satan attacks us on our weak points. So who do you think invented the educational philosophy that says don't worry about the weak points, just focus on the strengths? That's Satan trying to help himself. But you say, oh, but they have so many good ideas, so many good points. It's true. It's true. I'm not saying it's no good, but it's woven with ideas that teach us to depend upon ourselves. It's woven, let me say it this way, it's woven with the same educational philosophies that's caused the Jews to reject Jesus. 
how much poison does it take to make something dangerous? That's a rhetorical question, but it doesn't take much, right? <laughs> but friends, do we have accessible to us something which is 100% true? Or must we go to the world to learn? I must not have asked that right. You're all looking at me like bumps on a log. Do we have available to us a source that is 100% true? We do. How about the book education? How about child guidance, Adventist home, fundamentals of Christian education, Christian education, special testimonies in Christian education, uh, studies in Christian education, living fountains of broken sisters, and I could go right on down the list. We have before us an entire system of education which is 100% true. We can study it. We can apply it. We don't need to go to the world. To the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this world, it is because there is no light in them. Let me try to make this just a little more practical. In what ways do we teach the lesson of self-dependence? How about one of the most basic aspects of worldly education? That of sending a young child off to school. What lesson are we teaching? God's design was for that young child to be in the home, learning dependence on his parents, learning relationship, learning to rely on the Lord. We send him off to school. What are we teaching him? Self-dependence. He's going to have to fend for himself. He's going to have to make the way himself. He doesn't have somebody to rely on. He doesn't have somebody to answer his needs. It's going to be more difficult for him to see his need of Jesus. How about that one I mentioned yesterday with mothers and that connection that was needed and leaving a baby to cry themselves and not soothe them? What lesson are we teaching? I can't trust anybody. No one's there to help me. I guess I'll have to do it myself. How about the system of grades and honors and competition and all those things? It's teaching you, I can do it. I've got this. We don't see our need when we've learned to prove ourselves. And of course, any mixture of truth and error, any study of falsehood is teaching us to exalt our wisdom above God's. We should be content with what God has given us in his word, his counsel to us, because our only safety is dependence on him. Let me mention something else. This should ring some bells for you, because this is a point of discussion, to say the least, in our church. If we have learned to rely on ourselves through our education or whatever means, when we are confronted with overcoming sin, we will find it impossible. Am I correct? Because we can't do it in and of ourselves, right? It is impossible in and of ourselves to overcome sin. Those who have been taught to rely on themselves will conclude that overcoming sin is impossible. And we can't live a life of perfection. We can't perfect our characters before Jesus comes. Do you see how broad and far-reaching the implications are? True education, on the other hand, teaches utter dependence on God, recognizing that we are worthless. We have no, or hopeless, I should say. We're not worthless. Jesus saw worth in us. But our efforts are worthless. <laughs> Our hope, we don't have any hope in and of ourselves. We need God's help. The choice is presented before us today. Haskell writes again, as the Jews during the days of Alexander and his successors were without an excuse, 
So the Israel of today is set before the wisdom of the eternal in contrast with the wisdom of Greece. And the message is, choose you this day at which shrine thou wilt bow. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning of him will ensure eternal life. But accepting the writings of man, seeking to find out by experiment and speculation what must be known by faith, this brings death for it leads away from Christ. The first is the system of God of which faith is the motive power. The second is the Greek system which exalts human reasoning. One may not bow down to the idols of Egypt nor drink the wines of Babylon, but if he is entrapped by the more pleasing sophistries of Greece, his fate is the same in the end. But there's light, there's hope, because at the end of that intertestamental period, two families followed true education. Their names, Zacharias and Elizabeth, and Joseph and Mary. How was Zacharias educated at this time when the world was steeped in Greek philosophy as ours is today? How was Zacharias educated? Uh, Zacharias. John the Baptist educated. Did his parents send him to the schools of the rabbis? Spirit of Prophecy says, in the natural order of things, Zechari the son of Zacharias would have been educated for the priesthood. I guess I never thought about that until reading that. I'm like, wait, oh yeah, Zacharias was a priest. <laughs> John the Baptist had that ahead of him. But the training of the rabbinical schools would have unfitted him for this work. That is so key. God did not send him to the teachers of theology to learn how to interpret the scriptures. He called him to the desert that he might learn of nature and nature's God. And what about Jesus? Jesus followed the divine plan of education, the schools of his time with their magnifying of things small and their belittling of things great. He did not seek. What education did he receive? Four things right here. This is a curriculum any one of us can follow. His education was gained directly from the heaven appointed sources. Useful work. Do we have any of that today? Plenty. Study of the scriptures. Nature. Experiences of life. God's lesson books. We can follow the same education that Jesus received. Jesus never entered the schools of his day because of the mixture of the truth of God with heathen philosophy. While he studied the sources of truth as he sat at his mother's knee, other Jewish youth sat at the feet of the rabbis learning what the spirit of the Greeks taught and they crucified the Lord of life. Friends, this is a solemn message for each one of us. And I want to finish with going back to this statement that we started with. For more than a thousand years, the Jewish people had awaited the Savior's coming. But let's modernize this. Let's make this Seventh-day Adventist. For more than 180 years, the Seventh-day Adventist people have awaited the Savior's coming. Upon this event, they have rested their brightest hopes. In song and prophecy, in church service and household prayer, they have enshrined his name. And yet, at his coming, that's up to us. That's up to us. Will we recognize him when he comes? Well, the Bible says every eye will see him. He will be recognized physically. But the question is, will we recognize now the work that he wants to do for each one of us? That's the essence of true education. We need to set aside our own ideas, our own wisdom, and humbly trust to the simple methods of God. Dependence on man is going to lead us astray. Dependence on God will see us ready for Jesus coming. And I want to be there. I don't know about you. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this valuable lesson, for these stories from history that we can learn from. Oh Lord, help us to not make the same mistake that the Jews made. 
although you've told us we are making those mistakes. Help us individually to depend on you completely, to receive an education which will fit us to be ready for your coming. Thank you, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.